So we're about to get this started, man. All right, man. How you doing today, man? Good. How you doing? I'm good, man. Oh, shit. I forgot something. Hold on. Let me get this real quick. All right. Hey man, you see this five dollars I had up here, man? No. I could have sworn I had it right there, man. Right there? You don't see it? Don't it. No. Maybe it fell down? I'll help you look for it. What'd you just say? I'll help you look for it. Man, give me back my fucking money. Fuck. Shit, man. I'll help you look for <laughs> it. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Truth Addiction. This is the channel that deals with the disease of addiction and all the ways it manifests itself. I am a recovering addict, and my name is Brian, and I suffer from a disease which is incurable, progressive, and sometimes fatal. It can, however, be arrested at some point, and recovery is then possible. I'm sitting here with my man Josh. What's going on, Josh? What's up, brother? Three weeks in the making. Absolutely. I've been hounding this man to do this interview. And we're finally here, man. How you doing today? Good, man. How you doing? Good, man. You know, just running the rat race of life, man. Absolutely. Doing it clean, though. No doubt. You know? All right, so, man, this is what we do here, man. You know, I, I know you've seen an episode or two. Um, I'm going to run down these questions, man. And you said you'd answer them for me and for us, actually. And that's what we're going to do. Before we get to this, like the video. Hit that subscribe button for me. It's right down there below this video somewhere. You know what I mean? The more you support me, the more we carry this message, man. That's all, that's all it is. You know what I mean? All right, so, man, let's go. So let's kick this off. Uh, introduce yourself and tell us how long you've been clean, man. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm an addict, and uh, I've been clean since August 12, 2017. So a couple months shy of six years. All right. Congratulations. We're, 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 we're sim Well, I have six already. So we're I always thought you were in front of me. No, you're, but, like, you're, you're, you're like four months ahead of me, I think, right? So... We are growing up together in our program. Yeah, we're in kindergarten now. Which is cool. Yeah, we're in kindergarten. We got that nickel. So when you get to five, they say, you know, you get your marbles back. But what's the rest of it? In ten, you learn how to use them. In ten years, you learn how to play with them, right? All right. All right, so, man, so listen. Tell us where you were born, where you were raised, and a little bit about your early childhood, man. Uh, I was born uh, in a hospital, you know, like most of us. <laughs> Um, and then, so, you know, I was raised in, uh, grew up right here in, uh, Bucks County, right over in Croydon. Okay. And, that's, uh, that's PA. It's Pennsylvania, uh, yeah. by the way. Just outside of Philly, like 20 minutes. Yeah, there's, I, I've learned through my, uh, YouTube analytics that there's a couple people watching from London and India. There's an in India. And in Australia. So that's pretty cool. So I just try to no deal. let them know where we're at. Pennsylvania, United States of America, baby. Mm -hmm. All right, so tell us a little bit about your early childhood, man. Uh, normal childhood, man. You know, uh, it was me, my sister, my parents. You know, no problems, man. Like, you know, both parents worked. You know, we didn't have everything I wanted. My parents made sure we had everything we needed. Right. You know, um, had some nice things, like lost some nice things. Was raised with, you know... Like decent morals and values. I was a little, I was a little shit growing up, and you know. Like, so there was no drugs prevalent in your house or anything. No, no. My dad had uh, quit smoking cigarettes when I was in like kindergarten, and would drink occasionally. My mom was never a big drinker; still isn't to this day. You know, okay. just. Which, which you say you had a sister? Or I, have, I have an older sister. Did she? Did she get into anything? No, she is the normal one. Okay. You know, she's a uh, you know. Wasn't a straight A student, but you know, has her master's degree. You know, teaching for a decade. So, me and you are a perfect example of how this disease could touch anybody. Absolutely. I came up in a totally drug infested household. You came up with a pretty goddamn normal childhood with no drugs, and we both turned out whacked out. Hey man, no we drugs both in the We both destroyed our lives. No drugs in a household in Croydon is uh, an anomaly. So <laughs> that is an anomaly. <laughs> that is a straight up anomaly. You're right. So. What high school did you go to, man? And did you graduate? I went to Truman High School right here in Levittown. Okay. And I graduated in 2007. And then uh, went on to Temple um, and fucked around. But it took me about eight years and I finally graduated. Nice. So you did the college thing. You went I, to Temple. I did. Temple's a good school, man. 
That's a fucked up neighborhood. It's a good school when you know. <laughs> it's a good school when you actually go to school and don't just get fucked up, man. Right. You know? Yeah. That neighborhood's crazy. Oh it's yeah, man. Anymore, dude. I went down there to Temple Hospital to get my surgery a while back. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's <laughs> yo. You you walk outside that hospital, you might get a thirty eight stuck to your head. Talking it's wild, about it. man. But it's crazy because the hospital itself is one of the best ever. Absolutely. And it, 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 when you stay in that box of the hospital, you feel the money. <laughs> all you, you're just around rich in the hospital, mm -hmm. right? Doctors, all this stuff. But once you get out of that, it's it's crazy, man. So you were, so you graduated and you, you graduated college too. I did, man. What was it that you did in college? You? I went for music education. Nice. All right, man. Yeah, man. That's good shit, man. So, what's your your what's your uh, teenage years look like? Like, do you have any hobbies? You play sports or anything uh, like that? I grew up playing sports, doing like baseball and hockey. Um, you know, got into skateboarding around middle school, and then um, you know, once I got into high school, got more heavily involved in music. Okay. And then um, that was pretty much the course of my life for a while until drugs took over. So music, what were you playing? Like, what's your, what's your... Uh, I grew up, my dad was a trumpet player, so was my sister. So I followed suit and played trumpet from elementary school up to like high school. Okay. And meanwhile, learning like drums on my own and then just made the switch to percussion, man. All right. Did you ever like, did you ever, did you ever try to get into a band or anything when you were a teenager or anything like that? No, I thought about it. I mean, I got into playing, like serious playing when I was already like finishing high school, going into college. Okay. So if I would have gotten to that scene a lot earlier, probably would have, but... All right. Yeah, man. So, what age were you when you actually started using your, you know what I mean? Like your first, your first use. And, you know, we talk about everything as a drug, alcohol. Or right, right. I mean, you know, I was raised like in a Jewish household. So, I mean, like high holidays, there was always like wine on the table. So, if you want to like count that, because I have like vivid memories of like, just downing like glasses of wine and people have been like, oh, Josh is more fun yeah. when he drinks. <laughs> you know, like, oh, Yo, you, you know, you're more sociable. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, um. I can remember that shit too. My uncle's giving me a sister. No, but like the, the first use, you're on your, you're outside. You know uh, what I mean? You're, you're hanging or whatever it is. So probably like high school, like 10th or 11th grade over to Buddy's house. And, so what you are know, you like, 16, 17? Yeah, 16. So you, you, so you started when I did. Yeah. Dude, everybody I've interviewed so far is like, oh, I was 11 and I was 12. I'm like, damn, man. No way, Fucking man. Fucking young as shit, dude. <laughs> so you're 16. Do you remember what it was? Uh, alcohol. Drinking okay. beer. So, how'd that make you feel when you first got it in? When you first got it in, you remember that? that it was a that, wild that... sensation, man, because, like, I had never really been, like, that drunk before. You know, so we're in my buddy's kitchen just, like, shotgunning beers and just, like, throwing them back. And I'm just feeling, like, out of myself. And, like, oh, we're going to go to 7-Eleven. Let's, like, you know, ride our bikes. And I'm, like, felt like, uh, what's the guy who since I had LSD, like, Albert Hoffman or whatever, like, riding the bike on the first acid trip. Like, I was, <laughs> like, this is incredible, man. Like... <laughs> I wasn't just riding down the street. I was riding down the street, but like out of my mind, you know. But it was an incredible. Feel. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I remember. You know, I it, for me it was a forty of alcohol with with a, with a Xanax in it, and uh, I remember it felt incredible. And then I ended up getting sick at the end of the night, but it did feel. My home life sucked. And I and I felt good. I felt I felt extra good on the corner that night. Mm. Let's put it that way. You know what I mean? So looking looking back at it now, right? Because mm -hmm. we work steps in our we have steps in our lives, right? Absolutely. We do our thing. We have sponsors. We have home groups and all that stuff, right? Um, do you see any signs of disease of addiction before you actually used that first drug? <laughs> I remember. Um, when I first discovered, well, one, like video games and like staying up late and TV, you know, doing it to excess, like knowing I'm going to be like strung out the next day, continuing to do it. But I remember vividly being like 12 or 13 and going to the corner store and been picking up like a Red Bull and like that feeling of like a rush of like adrenaline and like basically what was a precursor to doing speed, like, oh, this feels good. And just would proceed to go back to the store multiple times a day so that people were like, oh yeah, Josh has a problem with Red Bull. Yeah. Like. You know, so it was the same addictive behavior, seeking the same outcome. Do you, do you remember being manipulative, being or anything like that, or how about this? I got the the mask wearing thing. I I can remember before I used pulling out the different masks mm -hmm. to be be around people. 
Do you remember any of that kind of shit? Or do you just think it was like addictive behaviors? Like It was addictive behaviors, but I remember going up to the, to the store and I was like a little mom and pop shop and I was like, you know, because I don't know, say it was like three bucks a can. I was like, if I buy like 10, like you give me like a deal on it? He's like, no, I'm like, I have to buy like 15. Like you give me, and, you know, I'm like some 12 year old kid. I had my first like summer job. So I had like cash in my pocket. And right. like to this day, man, like that's why I can't really carry cash. Because like if I have it, it's it's gone. Gone. You know? Yeah. It's wild how it affects you in, in, in different ways for sure. So take us, take us back to when you're in your active addiction. From, from that first use mm-hmm. up to you get clean this time. And could, just if you could break down that progression. All right. So, yeah. So early drinking in high school and then going off to college. Well, before I went to college, I went to Israel for 10 days. Nice. Drinking age was 18. I turned 18 on July 21st, went on August 6th. So I was 18 for like a week and a half and was just obliterated the whole time. And just liked how it felt and just kept it going. Came back and I was telling people, I learned how to drink when I went over there. So I was ready for college. That's that's what I was thinking. <laughs> and, you know, met people who drank like me, like to, you know, same music, same activities as me. And like, you know, have you ever smoked weed? And like, no. And then, you know, smoked weed. And then very fast, the progression, man. Like that was it for a while. But then all of a sudden, like Coke was there and Xanax was there. Perks were there. You know, Adderall was always abundant, you know, in the college scene. Right. You know, and then, um, you know, good long run with heroin and, um, you know, ultimately like landing into meth, man. And that was, that was my ultimate downfall. You did, so what, what, you just jumped right into heroin? Were you doing any kind of opiates, pills before that? Like perks and shit? Perks here and there. Cause you know, even being like in North Philly, like living down in Temple, it was still expensive. It was still like 25, 30 bucks, like a pill. So, yeah. and, you know, they're like, Hey, heroin's 10 bucks a bag. I was like, fuck it. Let's do that. So you're, you're doing the heroin while you're in Temple. Oh yeah. Oh shit! Okay. Yeah, man. I remember vividly going. So you held. You graduated with a heroin habit going on. Heroin, Adderall, Coke. Yeah, Damn, man. Damn. That that's did... why it took me almost eight years to graduate. <laughs> how the fuck did you hold that together, bro? Dude, dude. T- taking a medical leave of absence and you know almost like fail- not failing out of school, but like if I didn't take that leave of absence, I would have been done, man. Right. Dude, I remember so when I was in, I dropped out at. I, I made it past ninth grade, right? I think I had to do some summer school shit or something. But uh, um, I always say I dropped out of ninth grade because I never went back to 10th grade. But I had this opportunity, I think it was in eighth, to do this culinary schooling where you actually go on a ship and all this. Your parent had to sign off on it and all this. And um, once I started getting fucked up and... and uh, so it was going to kick in when I was in 10th grade, basically. Mm-hmm. And once I started getting fucked up, man, I just let that all go. But you held, you held it together and fucking as I graduated. So you said you jumped into meth after the heroin? Yeah, man. So I never did enough uh, heroin to ever, which is odd, because I did heroin almost like every day, but only like a bag or two a day. So never really enough to get dope sick, because like I was a trash can man. So like I could do a bag of heroin in the morning and be all fucking dazed out on the way to school. You know, stop by the bar after a couple of classes, like, you know, get nice and tight. And then, oh, we'll go, we're going to pick up Coke or we're going to go pick up shrooms or, oh, tomorrow night we're doing acid. Yeah, like, you were doing everything, it, bro. It didn't matter, man. Because I met people who came from, like, a real, like, sheltered and, like, caged life. And I saw, like, when they went to college, like, they just fucking... Yeah, it's like Catholic school kids. Exactly, You dude. know, it's crazy. You got all... I got this lady I work with. And she goes, oh, I'm gonna pay. she pays like nine grand for a kid to go to Catholic school. And she's gonna, it's safer. And it's like, listen, <laughs> when I was in, you know, I came up in South Philly, right? When we got out of our public schools, we went right over to the Catholic school because those Catholic school chicks were wild. Mm-hmm. The Catholic school kids were wild, bro. More money, more problems. Straight up. So you get into meth. Did that become like your sole drug? Uh, yeah, at the end. Because yeah. usually one takes over. Yep. You know what I mean? So it was meth? Yeah, because when I was still in school, like, I hadn't discovered meth yet. So I would I would just be up for five, six, seven days on Adderall and thinking, like, well, you know, like, crackheads are up, like, six, seven days. I could, that's fine. That was, like, my justification, man. Yeah. So I would just, like, pull all-nighters in the percussion studio, practicing for, like, eight, nine hours, be strung out the next day, go into class, just chugging coffee to not fall out. Like, mm. and that was normal, man. Dude, that's a wild drug. That's a wild. 
Dude, I, I'm, so I, I, had, I went, not too long ago, maybe like a year ago, there was this dude, you know, one of the, one of the sober houses I managed, the fucking dude is uh, bugging out. I get calls from everybody in the house. This dude's bugging out, man. And, you know, and I get over there, and he doesn't look high, but he looks fucking like he's been up for four days, mm -hmm. right? So I'm like, yo, come on, get in your car, man. We'll take a ride. I was going to take him over to my house and drug test him, right? So we get in the car and we start driving. He was like, you know, so what branch of the government are you with, man? And oh. I was like, I ain't got to test this motherfucker. Like, okay, here we he, go. He's already shot the fuck that's, up. That, that's but dude, it's crazy what that drug does. It's a, it's a nutty drug. Dude. All right, so take us back to the day before your last use, Ooh. right, if you can. Like, what's going through your head? Any fears? What's that day like? What's that day like for you, man? So... The last like, the last couple of days are all big blur, man. Because I remember, it was within like a week or so period. I remember that my dad had like come home and he was just like, you know, the police are. I'm ready to call the police. Like you have 20 minutes to put all your shit in this bag and we're gonna burn it, or you know they'll come arrest you right now. Wow. And I'm sitting there thinking like I'm beat, man. Like there's no more like I was going to the late meetings. That's why I'm out late or I'm going to this person's house or blah blah blah. All the lies were done. There's no more avenues, no more ways to bend the truth. I was like, I'm beat. And so, you know, I was like, all right, here you go, all this stuff. Knowing that I could just, like, go to my boy and be like, all right, dude, like, spot me. Like, I'm good for it. Okay. You know, play it safe. You know, don't use for a little bit. Like, it's going to suck, man. You know, go through some, you know, some uncomfortability. And then, like, once, like, it, you know, the flame dies down, just go back again. So, so you... So you were in a type, you were in desperation, but it was a, you still had an out. I knew, yeah. You still could have went and you stayed at your boys or something? And that's how I knew, like, I mean, there was no doubt, because this wasn't my first time trying before getting into recovery. So I, there was no doubt I was an addict, man, right. with the disease. But it's like, I, like, and anyone looking at it, it's like, dude, you're caught, like, red-handed. There's no way out, man. Like, just give up, surrender right now. And I'm like. I, I can get around this. Like, yeah, I can get you know? around it. I and can then, work this out. So then just ripping and running like the, for the next week, you know, and, um, you know, burning ties with everyone. Like the studio I was teaching at, like I was stealing from, that caught up with me. Like shit, you know, I was here. I was telling people I was someplace. They would check on me. I wasn't there. People like, what's going on? And then I just wound up at a Narcotics Anonymous meeting one day. One so, day. Um, yeah, that's a... See, I... I I, I, I think there's levels to desperation. And for some of us, it takes like this crazy, dude, it took me for like DHS to take my kids, fucking, I mean, every bridge is burnt. Mm -hmm. Everyone, um, like I'm part of this Naranon group, mm -hmm. right? And um, it's kind of like, they have these groups for people of families and friends of people that are all whacked out on whatever it is they're whacked out, right? And they have, a, they have a bunch of different ones of those. The one I'm with is, you know, I just hear all these tragic stories, bro. This is my son before he died, four days before he died, and all this stuff. And they're just going through it. They don't, or people that are living with a person that's using, mm -hmm. and they, they're at their wit's end. They just don't know how to. And um, what I tell them, the same thing that had to happen to me was, everybody had to cut me the fuck off. Oh, absolutely. Like, I just had to be cut the fuck off because you know dude par your parents and shit like this the last thing they want to do is fucking get rid of their kid mm -hmm. right that's a very hard you bring them to that point they have been through some shit right and it, at the end of the day it's probably scary for a parent or a wife or a husband to let go of that person but it's it's needed absolutely i think it's needed Baby anyway the addict, you're gonna bury the addict but man. yours is a little different because you had an out. Yeah. You you didn't you weren't completely burnt. No. Which probably was what you were I guess what you were about to get at was that's how you knew you were done. Because you still had an out and you still Yeah, mm -hmm. that's pretty So in other words, you don't have to burn your fucking bridge you don't you don't have to burn your house down to Yeah, I had burned pretty it. much all the bridges around me, but um yeah, so like my my last day using was not my worst day using. Like right. that whole that whole last week or week and a half hour long it was is kind of like a blur. It was like a lot of using, you know, I was so strung out, so I didn't know what the fuck was going on. And then, 
Yeah. It was just like, you know, it was like, you either do this or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I had been in recovery before. So I was like, all right, I guess I should go try this. It's not going to work. Whatever. It's not for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm doing meth. Everyone in this is doing heroin. Like, everyone's a heroin addict. Like, I'm not going to fit in there. Go in thinking, like, I'm not going to belong. Right. And then I just just stayed, man. So you go... So you go to a meeting. What's your what's your experience like with your and it, your first one ever, your first meeting ever? Did, was there a seed planted there, or were you just kind of like this is some bullshit here? Or, you so, remember any of that? So the the very first meeting I went to is when I was in the the highway alcohol highway like safety course for my first DUI. Okay. And uh, it was a mandated meeting we had to go to from like the inpatient or the outpatient program. You had to go. Everyone made the same meeting. And I looked at the guy speaking on stage, and he looked like me because I had longer hair at the time. And it, I saw myself like speaking on the stage, and I remember just being bugged out. Like, I don't know what to make of this like association. I didn't feel at home. I didn't feel disconnected. I didn't feel a part of. I didn't know what to feel. I was just like, and I went home, and my dad was like, "So what'd you think?" I was like, "It's not for me." Like, yeah, no way. Yeah, you didn't. So you didn't think it was for you? No. All right, but you made it back, man. Um, so, so you, you said, so did you stay clean after the first meeting you went to or not? No. No. Okay. So no, because I was there. That was from the first DUI and, um, yeah, it was mandated to go. And then I think I went to meetings after that and I stayed in there for a little bit right. and then ultimately backed away and then you. So this again. time you got clean, you came out of what, a rehab, detox, rehab? No, I just, uh, I went to like an outpatient a couple okay, days a so week. Okay, outpatient. And then you started your meetings there, mm -hmm. from there, and then you built your program from there, right? Absolutely. So, when you hear somebody has a disease of addiction, or when you think about yourself having a disease of addiction, what, what does that mean to you? What, the disease of addiction. The disease of addiction, it was explained to me, it's like, you know, once I start, I can't stop. The more I have, the more I want. Like, one is too many, a thousand is never enough. Like, all the cliches, you know, like, and the cliches are there for a reason, man. Mm -hmm. It's like, if I do something and it makes me feel good or I like the outcome, I'm going to do that again because it's not about, like, you know, I have to do this or I have to go here or I have to try with this combination or I'm going to try it differently. It's like I'm chasing that initial feeling. Whether I know it or not, man, it could be anything, Right. If it makes me feel good or I like the desired outcome and, you know, I get something out of it, well, of course we're going to go again. Of course I'm going to try to go harder. Well, if I try it this way now, like, right. you know, I'm not using so I could do this. I like that, you know. It's like normal human behavior taken to the extremes. It says in one of the, the literature books, it's like it, the disease of addiction is like, or yeah, disease is, addiction is the human condition to such an extent that we're willing to die for it or something like that. Right. I heard someone in a speaker, uh, speaker tape talk about that one time and it's, that's it. It's like, you know, we're driven to do like what makes us feel good, like driven, like going for like the serotonin, the dopamine, like the feel good right. molecules, like make the happy molecules work, man. And it's like, here's how we do it. But like. I'm going to keep doing it even though I'm not getting anything from it. Like now it's just reinforced. Now this is just what I need to keep doing. Right. Yeah. So at some point it becomes instinctual. Yep. It becomes survival. So in a way, what you just said kind of makes sense because if you think about it, if you look at it on a survival kind of thing, let's just say you're, you're in your own little patch of forest and you don't want nobody in your fucking territory taking your food. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. In a way, you will fight for that food or that mate. Uh -huh. I'm just going back to pure survival. Like if we're, you know, we're mm -hmm. on the fucking plains of the savannah or some shit, whatever. <laughs> but you know what I'm trying to say? When you Absolutely. think about it, I'm willing to die for it. Mm -hmm. Because I think I needed to survive. That's what your brain and tells you. And to me, you. that's what the disease is. When you actually think that something you're doing is, something that's fucking your life up and making it so unmanageable is needed to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fucking problem. Yeah, right? I had watched some documentary and they, they broke down the science of addiction. And it's like they talk about that where it's like you use so much, your brain becomes so dependent on it that it's like it associates it with survival. Nothing else matters but getting this substance or this activity or this whatever it is, right? Because right. it's you can replace it with anything. And it's like we associate it so closely with survival that like the house could be burning. But as long as I can go and pick up what as I need to pick up. As long as I can up, get one. And, be it, right. and it becomes... Just as important, if not more important, as things like paying your fucking mortgage, raising your children, 
you know, it's 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 that it's like there, there's a certain part of your brain. I, I I've I've watched a lot of scientific shit on it too, mm -hmm. and the words are really big. The parts of your brain, so I, I can't remember the fucking word. I I know like the prefrontal prefrontal cortex. Uh -huh. That's where our decision making that gets fucked up by all the dopamine and basically the rewiring of the brain that we do. Yep. Right over time. No doubt. You you know that like we literally change the fucking brain chemistry. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. And and there's certain channels that start to form in our brain to filter out dopamine, which creates tolerance. We call it tolerance, but right. I mean, it makes, it's wild, dude. It makes sense, man. Because like, if we had these initial like brain weight or passages for like how we're supposed to respond, how the brain functions, you know, think about it. Like, well, you know, what did I like to do during childhood? I like to ride my bike. So, but now if I want to go and ride my bike for enjoyment, I don't get the same satisfaction because right. that pathway is. That's not a pathway for pleasure anymore. It's been superseded by mm -hmm. whatever you want to put in front of it. So we no longer seek, see, feel comfort or seek comfort in like another lo loving person or, or you know, the, the, a beautiful sky or, or whatever. Right. Now our first instinct becomes where do I, I, I feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I want to get comfortable. Yep. Where do I go? The fucking bag, or the drink, or the pill. Mm -hmm. Let's hit it. I know exactly. And what that you do. is crazy. And that's why I try to tell people when they first come in: grasp this concept of a disease as mm -hmm. fast as you can, because you will suggest control to yourself mm -hmm. and be the fuck one out of here. You know what I mean? So, speaking of it, like, do you think there's a cure for the, for the disease of addiction, man? Yeah, twelve step recovery, man. You know. It's, it, Explain that to us. Tell us what that is for you today. What do you do, man? So when I came into recovery, I was told get a sponsor, get a home group, make 90 meetings in 90 days, prayer meditation, you know, get a phone list, get a network, all these basic suggestions, man. And uh, it was explained to me by people who were here before me and have stayed. So I, you know, been in recovery a couple of times, relapsed a couple of times. I was like, you know what, maybe I take the suggestions. And from early on, man, I, my first sponsor told me, like, if you go to a meeting, go hug three people you don't know. Get phone numbers. You know, get involved with service. You know, with, I don't know, a couple months clean, I followed them to H&I and stayed there for a couple of years. You know, um, got involved with, like, home groups, got involved with sponsorship, service, like, commitments for different, like, subcommittees and stuff. You know, right. um, you know working with a sponsor going through step work, like learning how to live in the step process. You so know. You, you, you entered a 12-step program and it hits you that I should do 12 steps. Dude, and so <laughs> because I would really arrogantly, because, you know, self-righteousness is one of my big character defects. Yeah, me too. I would really, you know, real smug and like real self-sure of my, self-sure is not a word, but really self, like, you know, I get it. We, yeah, be we, like, how can you be in a 12-step fellowship and not be working the 12 steps? You're fucking stupid. Right. And then I realized, man, because it says in our literature, like, you know, we, what is it? We vary in degrees of sickness and we recover at different rates. You know, whatever it is, it's different right. strokes, different folks. Like, what works for me is not always going to work for you. But, like, if you're an addict and I'm an addict or if you want to be in recovery and I want to be in recovery and this is what the program suggests, if it worked for this motherfucker, it's got to work for me. Right. You know, my head will tell me like, no, like, cause you're unique. Like it's you're well, you're not as bad as him or her or this person. Like, no, man, like it says it very clearly. And I'm sure worded differently in every different fellowship, but it just says like, we've never seen someone who's thoroughly followed our program, you know, relapse. Like, and I haven't dude. Like if I'm being dead honest, I've never seen anybody who is hitting on all those points. Sponsor, working steps, in close contact with the sponsor, home group, hitting meetings regularly, and having that network, and most important, a God of their understanding. Mm -hmm. If you're hitting on all those points, bro, I've never seen anybody. I've never seen anybody relapse. Because as a matter of fact, what do we hear when somebody relapses and comes back to the uh, My sponsor says this all the time. He's like, you know, you never heard someone say, I made more meetings, I talked to my sponsor more, I picked up the extra service commitment, I was more diligent in my step writing. He says, it's always the same. It's I stopped calling my sponsor, right. I stopped going to meetings, I stopped getting in touch with people, I was not honest with things, and then like, oh, I got high, how'd it happen? Right. You know? And that, and that that's... I, that, was, that was me. That's what happens all the time. I mean, shit, I had fucking, you know my story, man, I had fucking nine years clean. 
and decided I was normal. Mm -hmm. Didn't need to do the things that I was doing to stay clean anymore, like a fucking program or nothing. Yeah, no 12-step recovery for me anymore. I'm fucking totally normal, guys. See you later. Mm -hmm. And fast forward, you know, eventually it got me. It took me, once I left the program, it took me a year to use, dude. But once I did some champagne, mm. within five months of the champagne, I was fucking, everything was burnt to the ground. The progression was insane. Mm -hmm. So I just want to run, by, run this by you real quick. I look up shit. I do a lot of fucking uh, research mm -hmm. on things. And I can tell you this, dude. The rate that we're dying, with the people with the disease of addiction, the rate of deaths is fucking, I don't know what it is. I'm pissed off. I'm fucking sad. It's like, I, dude, I want to like march on Congress or something at this mm -hmm. fucking point. Like, I, I'm sick with it. We're up to like 125, 130,000, dude. Last year. That's fucked It's insane. And the year before that, it was like 90. It's like crazy. The fentanyl is killing motherfuckers. But anyway, so one of the things I looked at was the recovery rate for people. So 100 of us walk into a meeting for the first time trying to stay clean. Mm -hmm. And the rate goes around four to five percent, and it's like four of those hundred could stay clean for a, a year, but only one of those four will stay clean for five or more years. Wow. Now that's what it says. Statistics can be a little weird, but I've been coming around for a little bit. It seems to check out. Mm. It seems to check out, and I don't know if it does for you, but if it does or it don't, explain that. And if you do think it's low. Why do you think that is? What's the reason for that, do you think? Hmm. It's interesting. That's a crazy way to break down the statistics, but especially when you, like you said, you've been coming around, like you've seen it. Like, I can tell you, like, from, I can see, like, when someone comes in, it's it's very hard to judge right away. Like, oh, like, that motherfucker's going to get high, or that, that mm -hmm. dude's got to pee, he'll never get high, and then it's, you know, you could be completely wrong. But it's like, you see... Like, everyone comes in, it's the same way, like, when you, like, you started school, man. It's like, you know, your first day, teachers, like, everyone starts with 100%. So, everyone has a A+. Plus. Everyone is good to go. And then it's like, what you're willing to do to keep that 100%. So, right. if you're not willing to, you know, it's not the buffet, man. You can't just do one and not the other, and I'll do this later, I'll do this. It's like, you know, it's, so it's no doubt, man. Like, you know, people say around, especially our area, like, you know, it's a revolving door. Like, you could see someone's face and you never see them again. Maybe you see them in six months if they come back, right. if they make it back. So, it's like, be good to the newcomer because that could be your sponsor one day. Dude, so I'll tell you, <laughs> right? th this happened to me today, man. I was leaving work and um, I'm loading my truck and I see this dude walking out by the trucks and, you know, he looks mangled. You know, he's got like a dress shirt and it's all ripped open. He's in like shorts or like a bathing suit or something. He's got one shoe on, he's got a backpack and he's got money in his hand and he's just like skits. And I'm like, all right, he's using, you know, so he sits down like by our trucks and the other people I'm working with are like looking and like almost like, like snickering and like, you know, like not, not taking pictures, but I see their phones are in their hand. I'm like, all right. and I'm just thinking like this poor motherfucker, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're like, we're going to call the cops. Like, you know, this guy's being a nuisance. And in my gut, I'm just like, I got to go fucking talk to this guy. So talk to this dude, yeah. So I'm sitting there, and then I look, what the fuck is he wearing? He's got an orange key tag hanging from his necklace. And I'm like... What's that, a 60-day, John? Or? Uh, 30 days. 30 days, yeah, okay. And I'm just, like, looking, and they're like, oh... It looks they're like this guy's, you know, he's, he's all on drugs. And I'm thinking, like, and everyone that I work with, like, some people know that I'm in recovery and some people don't. Right. And I'm just sitting there thinking, like, that's a human being, man. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, you never know. That dude could have been a fucking rogue scholar. He could have been you know, anything. Dude, what? But he's, he's yeah. someone, could have been someone's dad, could have been someone, someone's son, dude, someone's brother. Dude, I used to cop down the way with a doctor. He was a fucking doctor. He was copping dope down the way. This was years ago. But it's like, um, see, we look at that and go, but if not for the grace of God, there go I. Because, yeah. Now, I can kind of see how society, listen, we wear on society, bro. Mm -hmm. We're robbing them. We're fucking, we're doing all kinds of shit. We're, we're eating their money up. We got them paying for fucking $3,000 Suboxone scripts. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Oh, how much is that 90 script of Suboxone? Oh, that'll be $4,000. But for you with your welfare insurance, it's only $1. Mm -hmm. But people pay for that. You know what I mean? So it wears. So I get it. Right. 
you can lose your compassion. And they, you know, if you don't have this disease, you just can't understand. That's it. You just can't, right? Because I can't go and tell those people I work with, like, you wouldn't, like, understand, like, a little, little more than six years ago, like, that was me. Deranged, yeah. like, talking to myself, psychosis, like, walking around, not knowing what the fuck is real and what's not real, like. Right. And that's, you know, a lot of society doesn't look at it as a disease. No. It's like, if you want to, you're just fucking your life up. You're choosing to do so. But, you know, you if know their, I mean? their nephew or their, their relative has a, they, have, they just have a problem with they that. They're not, they're not addicts. They're, they're not bad people. Right. They just made bad choices. But at the end of the day, they don't need to understand. Mm -hmm. As long as we understand and fucking get responsible for our fucking recovery. That's it, man. That's all that matters. So listen, man, real quick, we're going to wrap this up. Do me a favor and look into that camera, man. And if there's somebody out there who's struggling, they're on the fence. I don't know if this could work for me. Whatever. Maybe they think that they're worse off than we were. They're feeling unique. Right? Welcome. And they ain't. But what would you say to that person, man? Uh, I would say if you're feeling unique, man, welcome. Yeah. You know, if... Uh... If you're sick of feeling how you're feeling, and if you're not sure, and usually if you have to say, if you're not sure if you're an addict or you need to be in recovery, chances are you need to, but you're the only person that can answer that question, man. And the last thing is, like, what do you have to lose? Because best case scenario, you get your life back, you rebuild connections. Worst case is jails, institutions, and death, man. Right. I mean, that's what it is. So listen, if you're thinking tomorrow's the day I'm going to get clean, tomorrow might not come. I suggest you pick that motherfucker phone up because rehabs take you whenever. You can go to a fucking rehab at midnight, bro. Mm -hmm. I know I have before. Well, detox at least. So today could be the day you stop using. Pick up the phone, hit that rehab, and then get you a 12-step program when you get out of that. Any one of them, they're all sufficient for you with your disease, right? Get in where you fit in, man. All right, man, so that's gonna do it. I just have this little thing I do at the end of every video. It's really stupid. I call it the Fast Ass Five. It's five random ass stupid questions. Right. And I throw them out there and let's see what you got, man. So first question, summer or winter? Summer. Going summer. Vegetables or candy? Candy. Yeah. Horror movie or comedy? Comedy. Yeah. So you're at the barbecue, man. You going all beef hot dog or hamburger? Hamburger. Yeah, hey, I can't get an all beef hot dog. Nobody picks it. I tried to switch it up. I was saying hot dog. And then my man Bob was like, maybe you should say all beef hot dog. And it'll fucking confuse, it'll get some people. See, because I'll go all beef hot dog. All right. First off the hamburger. I'll hit a hamburger, but I'm going all beef hot dog first. All right, so here's the last question. You'd rather be brutally honest or lie when you have to, man? Oof. Lie when you have to. Yeah. I agree. It's an honest program, man. It's hard to say it out of your mouth. I'm going to lie and be brutally honest at the same time. What do you mean lie when I have to? Well, it's as simple as this. Brutally honest, you'll probably have nobody to fuck around you. Nobody would probably want to be around you. Brutally honest is, is your fucking girlfriend or whatever makes you some food. How's it taste? And you go, it tastes like shit. shit. <laughs> right? So we were up Ripley and mm -hmm. I was doing an interview with John. Mm -hmm. Right. If you ain't get a chance to check that, I, I did a, a, a episode in Ripley, West Virginia, um, at a, a convention, recovery convention. So I asked John that, and the lady walking behind the counter, she heard it, the camera, mm -hmm. and she heard it, and she goes, um, uh, "Honesty without compassion is brutality." And I was like, "Whoa, damn, yeah, that's some convention wisdom. That's right some there. wisdom right there." <laughs> but anyway. That's going to do it, man. I appreciate you doing this, man. Of course, brother. Hey, thank you guys for watching the channel. Thank you for supporting the channel, man. It's doing pretty good. You know what I mean? It's doing better than I thought. We ain't even hit the two-month mark yet. You know what I mean? I'm pushing 250 subscribers. It's a lot to me. Fucking right, man. And people are watching. And most of all, dude, I am getting hit up in my... Because I got my, my accounts connected with Facebook and shit. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on Facebook as Wawa Brian. And... um. I'm getting hit up in my comments and in the messenger. Hey, man, I got one. Dude, I just got clean a couple months ago. No shit. I love what you're doing here. You guys give me hope. Dude, or I had one dude comment, I'm really thinking about getting clean, and I was skeptical about it, and, you know, you got me kind of in that place where I think I really want to do this. I think I can do this. And that's what it's all, all the fuck about, bro. Absolutely. That's man. it, bro. Someone needs to hear it more than you need to say it, man. That's it, man. And you know, even people with time, 
anything can be said here that helps them on that particular day too. Absolutely. That's why I tell people to leave comments because they could have help me by just reading the fucking comment one day. You know what I mean? But anyway, that's going to do it. Listen, man, remember this. The disease of addiction, it's broad. And it's outside of the realm of just using drugs. Keep coming back. More will be revealed.